Hello YouTube. So, philosophers often use simplified examples to uh, illustrate or support their theories. One of the classics of the philosophical literature, which is used in various contexts, is water is H2O. Uh, the claim here is that water is identical to H2O. Water just is H2O. This example often appears in discussions of the Kripke-Putnam approach to natural kind terms, for example. Um, I won't examine this particular theory in too much detail, but the basic idea is something like this. Uh, every natural kind term, such as water, has a stereotype and an extension. The stereotype of water is essentially a description of the manifest properties of water, uh, a description of its macroscopic properties, its everyday properties. So the stereotype would be something like uh, a transparent, tasteless liquid with fairly low viscosity found in rivers and lakes sometimes falls from the clouds, which humans and other animals drink, and so on. The extension of a term is the set of things in the world to which the term refers. And then the, the, the key idea is that the extension of the term is determined by whatever underlying microstructure standardly causes the properties associated with the stereotype. So in the case of water, that's H2O. So water just is H2O. Water and H2O are identical. If you had a sample of H2O that did not behave like the stereotype of water, maybe because it's in unusual conditions or because it has been mixed with some other substance, well, it's still water because it's H2O. Conversely, it's in principle possible for there to be a substance that behaves exactly like water, but if we discovered that it had a different molecular structure, we would not, uh, at least Putnam thinks, judge it to be water. Water is all and only H2O. Um, and this identity is, as I say, based on the fact that the term water is associated with various macrophysical properties and H2O is the underlying microphysical structure that causes those properties. Again, we don't need to look at this in, in, in detail. Um, you can Look this up for yourself for more information, in particular Putnam's famous twin earth thought experiment provided the major impetus uh, for, this, for this theory. Anyway, the point is that on this view every uh, manifest kind is identical to a microstructural kind. And of course you don't need to accept any particular theory of language to agree with this point. Um, most of the people who accept strong forms of physicalist reductionism will find this very plausible. Uh, the various kinds that we distinguish in our everyday lives, the manifest kinds, will, through scientific investigation, be shown to be identical with kinds at a lower level. Science reveals how the world is built up from various parts, how the higher level parts are composed out of the lower level parts, and so you can draw uh, a, a correspondence um, between the higher level kinds and the lower level kinds. The, um, you know, so, so uh, you know, you, you have at a basic level um, atoms. Well, I suppose atoms aren't basic, do you? You've got, you know, protons and um, then, then, you know, quarks and so on. But, you know, take atoms, those, those kinds compose the molecular kinds and then the molecular kinds build up other kinds and then those other kinds build up other kinds and so on. Um, now, Michael Weisberg in his article, uh, Water is Not H2O, he calls the kind of view in question here the coordination principle. According to the coordination principle, there is a straightforward mapping between um, the manifest kinds and the kinds uncovered by science. Uh, and this shows that the manifest kind is identical to the scientific kind. Um, and whether, whether the scientific kind will be a description of the underlying structure and underlying properties that bring about the manifest structure and manifest properties that we observe. Uh, and this is, of course, a general claim about how kinds work. It's not specific to water and H2O, uh, but water is H2O is the classic illustration of this type of view. Now, many philosophers have argued that this view has serious problems. Uh, there are, are a variety of objections that we might raise, but what I want to focus on here is the argument that it rests on a simplification of science. Um, the claim that water is H2O is implausible just based on the chemistry of water. Uh, and obviously this point will generalize to many other natural kinds as well. Um, so the argument will be that we cannot in general coordinate everyday kinds 
manifest kinds with scientific kinds. We cannot in general show that manifest kinds are identical with an underlying microstructure. We're going to focus on water is H2O, uh, partly because it's the classic example and partly because water is a fairly simple substance, at least relative to many other things studied in the sciences. So if the attempt to identify the everyday kind of water uh, with some sort of underlying microstructure fails, uh, it probably fails for pretty much everything. Um, anyway, before discussing this, it is worth emphasizing that when we say that water is not H2O, what is being denied is the identity claim that certain philosophers have made. We're denying that water is identical to a particular microstructure or, the, or that the extension of the term water is anything with that microstructure. Um, obviously, uh, nobody here is denying the basic scientific facts that there are important explanatory connections between water on the one hand and the H2O molecule on the other. So let's begin then with uh, Michael Weisberg. Uh, his paper is, is just called Water is Not H2O. Weisberg notes that chemical kinds are individuated with respect to structure and reactivity at the molar, molecular and atomic levels. Molar structure concerns the atomic uh, concerns the macroscopic or uh, bulk properties of a substance. Uh, molecular structure is the spatial configuration of, of atoms and the chemical bonds between them. And atomic structure uh, concerns the kinds of atoms of which a substance is composed, the quantum states of those atoms, and so on. Now, in his argument against identifying water with H2O, Weisberg focuses specifically on the atomic structure of water. And the problem here is posed by isotopes. Isotopes are sets of atoms, all with the same number of protons and electrons, but different numbers of neutrons. Take hydrogen. Most hydrogen consists of one proton, um, and this isotope is called protium. There's also a fairly common isotope, deuterium, which has one neutron, and another, tritium, which has two neutrons. Um, we have actually made other isotopes with more neutrons in the lab, but uh, these, these three are the only ones that are naturally occurring. Uh, the hydrogen in water can take the form of any of these, of protium, deuterium or tritium. In fact, as it happens, the vast majority of hydrogen atoms in natural samples of water are protium. However, deuterium is found in all natural samples. I believe about 0.02% of the hydrogen by mass uh, is deuterium. Um, which, I mean, that's a small percentage, but, you know, given the number of molecules, uh, that's actually a huge number. Uh, given the number of molecules in a glass of water, say, um, you, you will be drinking billions of uh, atoms of deuterium every time you take a sip of water. Um, naturally occurring tritium is extremely rare, but it can be found in trace amounts in some samples of water due to factors like interaction with cosmic rays or contamination by leaks from nuclear sites. Um, yeah, when I actually, when I looked this up, um, it turns out that like of something like 40 nuclear sites, 30 of them had leaked uh, radioactive tritium. Not enough for it actually to be a problem, but apparently these leaks happen uh, quite a lot. Um, similarly, oxygen has three isotopes. Um, oxygen contains eight protons, but um, it can have eight, nine or 10 neutrons. Um, so our standard picture of water is H2, H2O, um, but it turns out that you're going to find plenty of uh, other isotopes uh, in, in the water. Uh, if you take enough samples of water, um, you're, you're going to find a huge number of um, different molecules. Now the question is, are all of these separate chemical kinds? Well, they can be individuated at the atomic and molecular levels. They have different properties. Uh, so chemistry does not give us a single kind, H2O, that maps with our ordinary term water. Water is instead a mixture of all of these chemical kinds. And so the general problem then is that chemistry does not provide us with a, a single kind which maps to our ordinary kind water, a one-to-one -one match between the kind terms of ordinary language and the kind terms of science is not possible. There are a couple of obvious responses to the isotope problem. One option is to hold that water just is standard H2O, that you know it, it just does consist of uh, 
two proteums and one oxygen 16, and the other isotopes are impurities. Uh, there's a reasonable motivation for this position. After all, the vast majority of water is indeed the standard H2O. Furthermore, if you were to remove the isotopes, well, it would still behave like standard water. It would look the same, react the same, you could drink it just the same and you'd be fine. Uh, you know, it's, if you had just literally pure H2O, um, that would be fine, right? Uh, it would just be like water. On the other hand, suppose you were to increase the deuterium, so you have a significant amount of uh, HDO and D2O. Uh, this is known as deuterated water or heavy water. Now this you would notice because this has different properties from ordinary water. Uh, most notably it has the effect of inhibiting cell division which is fairly deleterious to biological systems. Um, I mean obviously we can tolerate a bit of heavy water. Uh, you, can, you can gulp some down without any negative effects and there are videos on YouTube of people doing just that. But if you were to just drink heavy water, nothing but heavy water, it would kill you within a few days. So the thought is, well, why not say that our everyday use of the term water refers to H2O, standard H2O, and the other isotopes are impurities? Well, Weisberg rejects this response. He says, if we want to say that HDO is an impurity, then we first of all need a conception of what counts as the pure substance. So the assumption must be that the, the that pure water, the pure substance, right, is when you have two proteums bonded to an oxygen 16. But that's unsupported. Um, purity, according to Weisberg, means something like without changes or additions. Uh, we make something impure when we alter it, in which case it's actually the isotopically homogeneous samples that are impure, a sample consisting only of standard H2O would be impure water because natural water always contains different isotopes. Natural water contains a, a particular amount of deuterium, um, which you know has, has arisen from like the processes occurring like just in the universe and on the earth. Um, that has resulted in a particular concentration of deuterium. That's just part of natural water. As I said, every time you take a sip of water, you're drinking some deuterium. Uh, so Weisberg thinks that if you had a sample consisting of just standard H2O, that would be impure. Um, so the appeal to purity doesn't work. Now the obvious problem with Weisberg's answer here is that, I, so as far as I can tell, it seems to rest on a really weird definition of purity, right? I don't think purity is generally used to mean without changes or additions. Uh, that a pure substance is generally considered to be one that we haven't altered. Indeed, if you think about the very idea of purification, by definition, the process of cleaning contaminants from a substance, that kind of implies that purity can require a change in the composition of the natural sample, right? Like, it does, it's perfectly sensible to talk of purifying a natural sample of something, to take, taking a sample of a substance just from the world, just however you find it, and then putting it through a purification process. That, that seems a perfectly straightforward way of, of talking. Um, so I don't see, I, I, I just find Weisberg, uh, Weisberg's definition of purity here very strange. And furthermore, we have already seen that there are actually good reasons to designate standard H2O as pure water. Um, as I say, uh, you, you could remove the deuterium without any negative effects, whereas if you increased the deuterium enough, then it would have negative effects. So this doesn't strike me as a, a plausible counter-argument. Um, I think the purity reply remains reasonable. However, if you do find the purity reply unsatisfying, there is another fairly obvious reply. And this is that we should treat H2O as a higher order term, which encompasses all the isotopes. So the H here covers protium, deuterium, and tritium. And the same goes for the oxygen. That covers oxygen 16, oxygen 17, oxygen 18. We can think of H as a, as a genus, right, as specifying a genus and the specific isotopes as the species. Well then, water is H2O. We just have to be careful about what H2O means. Water, the, the everyday kind, maps onto the chemical kind of H2O when that chemical kind is taken as specifying a genus with many different isotopic species. So uh, the problem with this, according to Weisberg, is that it follows that, for instance, pure D2O is also water. 
Um, now, of course, we do call this heavy water, as we noted, but clearly this is a different kind from ordinary water because the properties of ordinary water and heavy water differ in fairly important ways. So D2O is not what we're referring to when we use the term water. Um, moreover, H2O uh, interpreted as a genus name doesn't name a chemical kind. Uh, Weisberg says that H2O and D2O are simply not the same kind of thing. So again, we failed to coordinate water with a chemical kind. Um, again, this response doesn't seem very persuasive to me. After all, in everyday language, we already do distinguish different types of water, and we all understand that water may have different properties in different conditions. If I go high up a mountain where the pressure is lower, the boiling point will decrease slightly. Similarly, if you add some salt to water, uh, the boiling point will increase. So we can recognize that D2O has different properties from what we think of as ordinary water while still treating it as a type of water. Uh, furthermore, Weisberg is surely correct that chemists will treat, um, well, in many circumstances at least, they will treat H2O and D2O as different chemical kinds. But there's also a pretty obvious sense in which at a slightly higher level, they are the same kind. I mean, that's the whole point of introducing the concept of isotope, right? The same element. So members of the same kind can have different isotopes, different numbers of neutrons. Proteum and deuterium are both kinds of hydrogen, and hydrogen is itself a scientific, it, like the, the H is a kind, right? It's so, so natural kinds can be hierarchical. You might have kinds A, B, C, D, and then kinds A and B sort into the high level kind E, while C and D sort into the high level kind F. So we can understand H2O as a just a slightly higher level chemical kind, and water refers to this high level kind. Um, so it doesn't seem that isotopes are really much such a problem for the coordination principle, um, for views like the kripke putnam account of kinds, or for views like reductionism. There are, however, maybe more serious difficulties for the identity between water and H2O. Weisberg focused on characterizing the atomic structure of water. Here we turn to problems of characterizing the molecular structure. So let's ignore isotopes. Even so, the molecules in, the, in any sample of water do not consist of a collection of H2O molecules, two hydrogens and one oxygen. Um, you have, you'll have a collection of unlinked H2O molecules only with water vapor in very specific conditions. In a glass of liquid water, molecules are constantly bonding, atoms are constantly being exchanged. Due to the chemical bonding of water, there are hydrogen bonded polymers of the H2O molecule, where one molecule is linked to many others, right? So you don't just have single H2O molecules, you have these larger structures as well. Um, and due to the self-ionization of water, there are hydrogen ions, there are hydroxyl ions, hydronium ions, plus polymers of these. So on a molecular level, water is in constant flux. There are constant associations and dissociations, higher level structures forming and breaking apart. Uh, at a given temperature and pressure, the concentrations of the different molecular and ionic species are fixed, but each individual molecule is, as I say, in constant flux. And if you vary the temperature and pressure, the polymerization and ionization rates will vary as well. And this is just considering liquid water. If you start to think about water in different conditions, um, the molecular structure changes very radically again. If you think about the, the, the underlying molecular structure of ice, for example, is obviously quite different from that of liquid water. Um, furthermore, as Paul Needham points out in his article, What is Water? These kinds of difficulties are, are exacerbated when we consider that water occurs in solutions as well. Let's take a caustic soda solution. Both the water and the sodium hydroxide will be sources of hydroxyl ions. Well, is there any way to specify whether a given hydroxyl ion belongs to the water or to the sodium hydroxide? I mean, obviously not, right? It's That's going to just be indeterminate. Um, so. Perhaps it makes sense to say that the, the other isotopes are impurities, that deuterium counts as an impurity in water. But that kind of move makes much less sense 
in this case. After all, what we're describing here is just how normal everyday water behaves on a molecular level. The constant flux of interactions, the polymerization and ionization producing different ions and uh, proton, you know, pr electron transfers, proton transfers, all of that. That's, that stuff is precisely what is responsible for the observable properties of water. The fact that a H2O molecule can form hydrogen bonds with other H2O molecules, uh, creating polymers whose bonds require energy to break, that helps to explain water's relatively high melting and boiling points compared to similar liquids, its relatively high specific heat capacity, its high surface tension, and so on. So these, um, these processes on the molecular level, these structures on the molecular level, are part of how we explain the observable properties of water. Um, in other words, when we look at water and we say, like that stuff there, when we specify the stereotype of water and we want to link it to some microstructural properties, it's not enough to just say H2O. Um, we might, in principle, be able to remove deuterium and still have water, much as we can, in principle, remove normal other types of impurities. But we couldn't even, in principle, have a kind of beanbag collection of H2O molecules and have a glass of liquid water, uh, at least not given our actual physical laws. So it appears then that water has no single microstructure at all, but lots of different microstructures, many of them very complex. Um, the situation is not one where water is identical to H2O, rather there are uh, explanatory relations between kinds at different levels. Um, so yes, there is a very important explanatory relation between the H2O molecule and water, right, the kind water, but it is not one of identity. Um, so anyway, the, the, the first response that we saw in the isotope case doesn't work here. Uh, it, it really wouldn't make sense to, to talk of impurity in this case. What about the second response? Can we interpret H2O in a higher level way so as to cover all the polymers and ions, all the blooming, buzzing confusion at the molecular level? Well, actually, yes, we can. Um, there is an important distinction in chemistry, which we've ignored throughout this video, um, but we'll bring it up now. The distinction between composition and microstructure. Most of us, when we think of the term H2O, will imagine uh, a model of a molecule. We'll imagine something like this. Uh, one oxygen atom bonded to two hydrogen atoms. Uh, and, and in this sense, uh, the term H2O specifies a particular molecular structure. But among chemists, that's not how the term is usually used. Uh, rather, it's a compositional formula of a compound substance. It tells us that the substance contains hydrogen and oxygen in certain proportions. It gives us the relative amount of hydrogen and oxygen. As uh, uh, Jap van Brackel, or Jap van Brackel, I'm not sure of the pronunciation, in his paper on the inventors of XYZ puts it, uh, we can take H2O interpreted broadly to mean, and I quote, produces two volumes of hydrogen and one volume of oxygen when subjected to electrolysis. Uh, we could interpret it that way, right? Um, I mean, maybe there would be other techniques for, for separating the substances, but you know, you, you, you get the point, right? Like, uh, if you look at it as a compositional formula, then it just tells you the relative amount of hydrogen and oxygen. Uh, the best way to see this is to see this distinction is to consider isomers. The compositional formula for ethyl alcohol is C2H6O, but this doesn't designate ethyl, ethyl alcohol because alcohol has an isomer, dimethyl ether, with the same composi compositional formula. The atoms occur in the same proportions, but they're arranged differently. So we represent isomers with structural formulas which specify the arrangement of the atoms. So there's the, those are the structural formulas for ethyl alcohol and dimethyl ether. So C2H6O is the compositional formula for ethyl alcohol. It tells us the relative proportions of the elements of which it is composed. Uh, C2H5OH specifies the microstructure. Now, point is this, H2O is a compositional formula. And since water has no isomers, it can be straightforwardly identified with H2O. H2O isn't ambiguous in the way that C2H6O is. Right, if you say H2O, you've specified water, at least if you 
look at it as a compositional formula. So water is H2O. The average ratio of atoms in a glass of water is two hydrogen to one oxygen. Polymerization, ionization, all those other processes at the molecular level are irrelevant to this. Now this move I think is, is fine. Um, if the term H2O is taken as a compositional formula, then it's true to say that water is H2O. And, um, and that may well be what most chemist, chemists most of the time mean when they say water is H2O. But the obvious problem with this move is that it looks like we're now just giving up on the idea that water, the everyday manifest kind, the clear transparent fluid that quenches thirst and fills the lakes and rivers, we're giving up the idea that this stuff is to be identified with an underlying chemical microstructure. Instead, what we're doing is simply relating a particular manifest kind, water, with two other manifest kinds, hydrogen and oxygen. We're just saying that water is a compound composed of hydrogen and oxygen in the proportion two moles to one. Um, one way to see why this doesn't achieve the kind of reductionism of the coordination principle is to again consider isomers. If we say that ethyl alcohol just is C2H6O, that these are identical, well, I mean, first of all, we've said something obviously false because dimethyl ether is also C2H6O and ethyl alcohol is not identical to dimethyl ether. But uh, more importantly for, for this context, we obviously haven't actually specified an underlying structure, um, an underlying microstructure that is responsible for the manifest properties of ethyl alcohol. So there's, there's a general dilemma then for any views which assume the coordination principle. On the one hand, we might take H2O to be a description of a microstructure. It describes an oxygen atom bonded to two hydrogen atoms. Most philosophers have interpreted H2O in this way. In that case, water is not H2O. On the other hand, we might take H2O as a compositional formula. Well, in that case, water is indeed H2O, but there doesn't seem to be the kind of reduction of the, of the manifest kind to the chemical kind um, that is uh, required by the coordination principle. Um, so anyway, that's uh, that's that. Uh, that's all I have to say about that. Um, that's just a bit of an introduction to some of the uh, complexities that uh, many philosophers think have been missed uh, by simplified examples like water is H2O. Um, thanks for watching.